Hello, and welcome to the first lecture in our series on vertex operator algebras. Today, we are starting with the basics, algebras, which are just vector spaces with some additional structure. Of course, they have deep connections to all sorts of ideas across mathematics and physics. So to help set the stage for those applications and the rest of the lectures, we'll need to step even further back into your mathematics history. Everything in algebra hinges on the operations ideas like addition and multiplication. We're going to step through some basics of fields and vector spaces and see how these kinds of operations evolve along the way. Tracing through the extensions of these operations will hopefully give you a stronger intuition for how more complex structures work. We start, of course, at the beginning with numbers. Fields are the big A algebraic notion of a number system. Fields are numbers that come equipped with two operations addition and multiplication. Besides having inverses and unit elements, these operations both satisfy the commutative and associative laws. Additionally, multiplication distributes through addition. Now, one wrinkle in this discussion is that fields can be finite or they can be infinite. For us, we'll consider infinite fields, what we usually talk about when we talk about numbers. And so henceforth, all fields considered implicitly will have characteristic zero unless otherwise specified. Even if many of the ideas can be extended to finite fields with character not equal to two, we're going to follow FLM here and just ignore them. Fields of characteristic two, of course, leads to all kinds of trouble when you're talking about bilinear maps and so on, but generally shouldn't concern us in this context. Moving on to vector spaces. A good study of linear algebra is an important prerequisite for this series, so I'm only going to offer a very pointed perspective on this topic. Vector spaces also have two kinds of operations, vector addition and scalar multiplication. A typical example of a vector space is a tensor product of some fixed field. Indeed, each vector space is defined over a given underlying field, as we now discuss. Vector addition can be thought of as a formal sum over some copies of that given field. And scalar multiplication can be thought of as an extension of that field's multiplication to distribute over that formal sum. From this perspective, the operations of vector spaces coincide with those of the underlying field precisely when two vectors are linearly dependent. And now for the topic du jour. A little a algebra is a vector space equipped with a multiplication between vectors. Note that this is not an inner product, which typically maps bilinearly to the underlying field. Here, our generic algebra is denoted capital A, and our underlying field, as always, is F, which could be thought of as, say, the complex numbers. Inner products are useful for projecting one vector against another, or assessing some kind of magnitude, perhaps to develop some kind of normalization. But this is not the kind of vector multiplication that we aim to discuss, at least at this point. A better example is the cross product in R3, which takes a pair of vectors to a vector. Famously, this multiplication rule only works in three dimensions. But, you know, that's because its definition is explicitly three dimensional. It follows the same algebra that you would find in, say, the imaginary quaternions, where, say, i, j, and k all square to minus one, and i times j equals k, as does its cyclic permutations. Of course, a lot of cohomological lip service is often paid to the cross product using words like axial vector and so on, because it more naturally sits in an extended structure known as the exterior algebra. We'll see that too in time, but for now we can consider the happy coincidence of three dimensions as a motivating example. There's a different perspective on vector spaces that might be helpful in discussing these matters. Instead of thinking of vector addition as a formal sum, you can think of it as a totally different kind of sum, an abelian group sum, for, you know, for some friendly abelian group. From that perspective, we can view the vector space as a field action over that abelian group. And from that perspective, an algebra is a field action over some ring. So that vector multiplication itself is inherited from the base ring multiplication, and therefore has little to do with the operations from our underlying field. Just as a lot of our ideas about algebras will build upon concepts in vector spaces, many more of them can be ported directly from the theory of rings. Having seen R3 with the cross product, let's take a look at some other examples, 
the complex plane, which is linearly isomorphic to R2, is an algebra, where vector multiplication is basically defined by the rule that the imaginary unit should square to minus 1. Analogously, the quaternions, which are linearly isomorphic to R4, form an algebra with the imaginary multiplication rules already discussed. Less obvious examples include the set of smooth functions of a real variable, or even the polynomials in f over some formal variable x. I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that these are indeed algebras. Most of the game moving forward will be discussing ever more structure latent in algebras, and to do that we begin with substructure. A linear subspace of some algebra is called a subalgebra if it's closed under multiplication. Like I said, many of our algebraic definitions are going to simply extend linear definitions, so we'll move through them pretty quickly. One bit of notation here that FLM is using that I think would be quite useful. Let V and W be linear subspaces of some algebra A. Then VW is the linear span of elements that are products, one from V and one from W. Another way to say that W is a subalgebra of A is to demand that WW, that is W squared, is contained in W. Hopefully you find that notation intuitive because we'll be operating with it implicitly quite a bit. Let's now consider some different flavors of algebras. A commutative algebra is, unsurprisingly, an algebra whose vector product commutes. It's a field action over a commutative ring. The complex numbers are a great example of a commutative algebra. Similarly, an associative algebra is a field action over an associative ring, which means two things. First, there must be a two-sided unit element in the algebra with respect to vector multiplication. Second, the vector multiplication must satisfy the associative law. Complex numbers are also a great example of an associative algebra. The quaternions too, although they are not commutative. The octonians, which are linearly isomorphic to R8, form an algebra that is neither commutative nor associative. Instead, they have a rather complicated multiplication graph. The complexity of the construction runs away so that the next obvious candidate division algebra completely loses distribution, and hence is not an algebra. The division algebras are a common entry point into the study of algebras generally. A naive question that immediately arises from their discussion involves the compatibility between commutation and association. Is there such a thing as an algebra that is commutative but not associative? As it turns out, the answer is yes. The Grice algebra, which is related to the monster group, furnishes such an example. You too can furnish a representation of that algebra in terms of matrices, but the space they act on is something like 196,883 dimensional. Worse, to generate that algebra, you might start with some matrix, but that matrix takes up five gigabytes of disk space. That's more than twice the digital information stored in this lecture's video, rendered in 4K. Crazy, but hey, that's why we're here. We'll come back to the Grace algebra in a later lecture. And now back to some more routine discussions. A linear map between two algebras is an algebra homomorphism if it preserves the vector product. A linear endomorphism takes a vector space back to itself. We'll be dealing a lot with endomorphisms, and we'll need to distinguish between linear and algebra endomorphisms. And in the context of algebras, both kinds are vital to our discussions. An algebra homomorphism that is also a linear isomorphism is called an algebra isomorphism. It preserves all the relevant structure, and if one exists between two algebras, they are effectively the same. To acknowledge that, we call such algebras isomorphic. An algebra endomorphism that is also an algebra isomorphism is called an automorphism. Automorphisms, again, both of linear and algebraic type, are crucial for understanding symmetries. And now to a distinguished class of linear endomorphisms on an algebra that is worthy of a little discussion. Let D be such a linear endomorphism on an algebra A. D is a derivation if its action on A satisfies the product rule familiar from elementary calculus. Indeed, any connotation of the word derivative by the choice of the operator name D is entirely intentional. The concepts are deeply related. One poetic way to think about a derivation is that it braids vector multiplication across vector addition in a symmetric way, acting on one factor at a time. Note that because of this, they are absolutely not a homomorphism. 
derivations will become an enemy or a friend, depending on your perspective. In either case, they will be a common fact of life in almost everything that follows. And that's our show! Next time, we will discuss Lie algebras. Get psyched!